Okay, so this will be a short little talk for five minutes about fracture reductions, and we'll actually bring out a table and just show you a demonstration of reducing a distal radius fracture. Um, so a couple of things. From an orthopedic surgeon's point of view, it's a very simple way they think about fractures. And if you just remember this one phrase every time you see a fracture, if you say the phrase, and it forces you to answer two questions. And the questions are regarding the two simple goals of fracture management. What do surgeons want to do? They want to get it straight. They want to keep it straight. Obtain a reduction and maintain a reduction. So every time you see a patient with a fracture, say the phrase. Like we're, ha we're sometimes happy just making the diagnosis. Oh, I got a fracture. What you need to do is go to the next level and think about what the proper management is long term for that patient. So obtain and maintain. So every time you see a fracture, say the phrase obtain and maintain. So here's a patient with a buckle fracture of the distal radius. Obtain asks the question, is the position acceptable? And this position's acceptable, so it does not need a reduction. Maintain asks, will the, pay, will the fracture shift with activities of daily living? And there are eight randomized control trials that say that if this fracture is treated in a Velcro splint, just in a, even just in a, in a tensor bandage, they will do fine. They don't need a cast. Most people get some sort of immobilization, either a Velcro, Velcro splint, fiberglass is fine, because molding is not important. So therefore, if this is a stable injury, they need comfort and protection. Here's an 11-year-old who fell and injured their elbow. We'll talk about Pete's elbows tomorrow. Most of them are supercondylars, but the odd one sneaks in and is a radial neck fracture diagnosed by the eMERGE doc. Excellent. So it's an uncommon diagnosis picked up by the eMERGE doc. When you see a diagnosis, though, and you diagnose a fracture, every time you see a fracture, say the phrase, obtain and maintain. Obtain. Is this position acceptable? Because the ice cream is pushed off the cone. And is that position acceptable? You may say it's a child, it remodels, I think it is. But if you're not sure, you should actually find out. So what happened was, in this actual case, is the, an excellent eMERGE doc saw the case, back slab, follow-up with orthopedics the following week. Patients seen on a Tuesday, follows up in clinic on a Friday, so now it's 10 days after injury, and ortho sees the case and says there's a problem. The problem is ortho wants to push this back up. Because if it heals in this position, and it will not get better when it heals, it may get worse, but the position will never improve on follow-up x-ray. So if this is the best it's going to be, there's a 50-50 chance, ortho says, they'll have problems with pronation, supination. So he wants to do a closed reduction, but the problem is this kid's been healing the fracture for 10 days. If he sees it day one or two and pushes on the radial neck, no problem. The weak link in the chain is the fracture. But kids are growing machines, they're healing machines. They heal these fractures really quick. Within a week, this fracture is healed that the weak link may be the growth plate. And if the surgeon tries to do a closed reduction, he's more likely to injure the growth plate because the fracture itself has healed. So that's why it was a problem. So he says, I have no choice now, I have to leave the kid, and in six weeks, if we find long-term he has problems with pronation, supination, he now needs an osteotomy, an open procedure, we can, so he can break the bone, realign it, and then put a K-wire in as opposed to a simple closed procedure. But saying the phrase obtain and maintain forces you to answer questions, and if the answer is, I don't know if that position's acceptable, then during a reasonable hour of the day, call. And then you'll say, I've got this 11-year-old kid with a radial neck fracture that's displaced. Is that, is that position acceptable? And they can triage when they want to see it. But if they see it a week or 10 days later and they want to do a closed reduction, it's a challenge in children. 86-year-old guy, he just turns, he's in his walker, he just turns, and this is what happens to his leg. If ever you see an x-ray where the knee is the AP view and you get a lateral of the foot in the same image, this is probably the x-ray you shouldn't see. Like, just straighten it out. You don't need an x-ray to go, I think it's broken. Like, it's broken. This is like the chest x-ray for tension pneumothorax. This is like the 12 lead ECG for V-fib. Like, you shouldn't see this, right? If you look carefully as well, there's air. He has an open fracture. So obtain and maintain, clearly this position is not acceptable, so it gets reduced. Will this fracture shift? Of course, it's grossly unstable. So once you reduce it, that's fine. You should be talking to a surgeon. Clearly this is an open injury you'll be talking. Even if it's a closed injury, if you think it's unstable, grossly unstable, you need to talk to a surgeon so they can plan surgery. If it's a trimal, an excellent position in a younger patient, the surgeons may send them home and plan to come back one or two or three days later. But at least they can plan the surgery. So if it's grossly unstable, they go to the operating room, right? So get the surgeons involved for grossly unstable fractures. And here's a 22-year-old who fell snowboarding. Obtain and maintain. Is this position acceptable? 
No, in a 22-year-old, you want this as anatomically reduced as possible. So she gets reduced. When you reduce the fracture, is the, tendency, the tendency of the fracture is to go back. When you loosen a fracture, it wants, it's loose again. It wants to get back to where it came from. So the tendency of the fracture is to shift, so it's unstable. So therefore, you need to mold it. If you're going to mold, plaster is way easier to mold than fiberglass. So if molding is important, plaster is important. You put plaster on both sides of the fracture. And we're going to walk you through the reduction. If you guys don't mind just bringing up the, uh, the, uh, uh, the stretcher when you have them in here. But the little steps you go through when you go through a, uh, a reduction, get everything ready first. For your and we're going to show this to you. And then we want you to go through this mnemonic of tramp. What does that mean? So T is traction. If you think of the fracture, it's impacted typically. And traction disimpacts the fracture. Then what you need to do is you need to reduce it. So the fracture is out to length. Now that it's free, you can try to reduce it. And ortho will often tell you, increase the deformity. Why is that? Because there's soft tissue. There's periosteum that's locked in here. And if you increase the deformity, you unlock that soft tissue. You're actually taking the fracture back to where it came from. So when you put it back where it came from, it's easier to do the reduction. If you just traction it and try to reduce it, the periosteum may be caught underneath. And it may be difficult to do the reduction. When you do the traction and the reduction, then you apply the splint materials. And this is our cast cart. We do tons of reductions in our emergency department. We don't have ortho residents, we call. The ortho surgeons don't come down to do re typical reductions in our emerge. We do them all. And our cast cart is very simple. It's a four inch box of plaster, a six inch box of plaster. We have something to protect the skin and something to hold it down. That's really all that it is. It's a very, and you can MacGyver, you can create any kind of splint you want. Molding is important. If you reduce a fracture, it wants to go back to where it came from. So you're going to mold it to prevent it from shifting back. And then position. And what does position mean? What's the position? You want, how far up do you want to go? What's the position you want to put the fingers in? Make sure the thumb is free. These are all important pieces of it. So, thank you, Paul. If Paul had a fracture of his distal radius here, here's how we would manage this. So I would want to do is, you just, one of the best ways to get, to, just find out the length of the splint you need is just take some cast padding. And if this is the wrist that's injured, guess what? The other one is the same length. So just touch the unaffected one. And if you want to measure for size, so, I mean, typically I might go to the other side, but this is not obviously injured, so I will touch this side. But measure on the unaffected side with his elbow straight, Go from the metacarpal heads, where to? To the elbow, and tear. You want to be two finger breadths short of the elbow, but plaster shrinks about five or 10%, so measure to the elbow and it'll shrink. Typically what you need is, you need, since you need plaster on both sides of the fracture, for most adults, it's six inches. If somebody's got really big forearms, you may need more than that, right? So don't memorize, just customize. Plan it for what the patient needs. Then what you do is you just cut the plaster. Now you've got the plaster cut, so typically you use, five, you'd use 10 layers. This comes in layers of five, so I'm just using five, but in a real patient, you'd use 10. Then you fold this over. And once you fold it over, this splint is going to run from here down to here. What you want is a little bit of space for the thumb. If you look at his hand, look where the distal palmar crease is, and the distance that you come down from there to the base of the thumb, that's how far you're coming down. That's the bridge of plaster. You want his thumb to be free. So with your scissors, which are here, that same distance, the thumb hole down, go about halfway across, make a little triangle for his thumb. And then you just tear this off. And now what you have is you have a splint. If we can just have your arm again. I think we need more propofol. Uh, but anyway, if, you, if you have an arm, you can see that it's a, it'll put plaster on both sides. This, if it's a little long, we'll curl it back. So now we've got our splint ready, we have our padding ready, we have our cling to hold it down. Don't use ace bandages or tensors, you put way too much pressure on it. This is cling, used over kids' IVs, over dressings, it works beautifully. And then you need some tape. So just tear off the tape and have it ready. And now what we'll do is we'll go through, now that we have everything ready, we'll go through the traction, the reduction, we'll apply splint materials, show you the molding, and then we'll tell you how we think about the positioning at the end. So, he has a distal radius fracture. If it's a typical Coley's fracture, it's dorsally displaced. If it's dorsally, you'll feel the step. Take his normal wrist and just feel what normal anatomy is like, because this is what you want to recreate afterwards. 
And when you see this step deformity, it's great. You can actually also feel his radial styloid, his ulnar styloid. You'll see if it's shortened. Start to feel what normal is like. And then before you get started, just see how loose the wrist is. And you'll see it's actually fairly tight. His wrist is moving, but the fracture itself is fairly snug. And this is how you know. Once you've tractioned it, you'll know it's loose. So with your trusty assistant, anybody just grabbing on the one side, I put both my thumbs on, on either side of his distal radius on Lister's tubercle, index fingers on the palmer side, and I'm just water skiing. If this is done under hematoma block, I'll be talking to him, but trying to relax his muscles. Just so if he's relaxed, it allows me to open this up. If it's done under procedural sedation and he's pretty deep, we don't need to do so much of it. And then I'm just slowly moving it around. And you actually just make little circles and free up the distal fragment. You'll feel that it's loose. You're unlocking it. And now that we've done the traction, we do the reduction. So what does the reduction involve? Pushing down to increase the deformity. Pull my elbows in towards me and I bring it down and I reduce the distal radius. Now, it's also impacted radially, so it gets ultimately deviated. And when you have it only deviated, you'll feel that the radial styloid is passed, the ulnar styloid, it's moved out. You'll actually feel with your fingers that you can, you've made the, brought this out to length. You'll feel the step deformity is gone. Then your assistant can just come around, if you don't mind coming this way, Jeff, thank you. Then he can just grab or she can grab from the thumb and two fingers. And when you grab from the thumb and two fingers, you put the wrist in ulnar deviation. If you grab the whole hand, it goes back to neutral. And this maintains radial length, which is a very important part of reduce, when you reduce these fractures. Then take your padding, start right at the elbow, 100% overlap at the first one, and then 50% overlap after that. They don't need stocking yet. Where is the plaster going to be? Then you need two layers of padding. You can do a figure of eight around the wrist. Where's the bony prominence, the radial styloid, and then tear it off. Don't over pad. If there's too much padding between the plaster and the fracture, it's harder to mold it. You want a nice, intimate splint. Next, we get it wet. So take your layers. Again, this would be 10 layers in a real patient. Get it wet. And just let it drip. Have some patience. The water should be lukewarm at best. Okay? If you want, you can take a little bit of the water out but don't aggressively strip this. Some people are very proud of how white the bucket looks after a reduction. That's the strength, that's the plaster. It should be in the splint, not in the bucket. You want a relatively clear bucket afterwards. And once you've got this, you just bring it, we'll bring his thumb up. Let's release his thumb for a minute, thank you. And now what we do is we just drape this over both sides here. Take your time with it. And you want plaster equally on both sides of the fracture. You want two finger bits for the elbow. So if it's a little long, you can fold it back. Paul has a bit of a longer arm. His, his arm is actually quite thick. Here, I feel like I'm only getting like about 60%. I'm not getting quite the 75 or 80%. So in that case, what you can easily do at this level is just take an extra layer, just get an extra strip. Plaster is so easy to work with. I can fold this over and make it, this is now 10 layers, and four inches becomes two. I can just take this and I can just supplement on this. And now I've got a wider splint. Take the cling. Again, always roll off the bottom. 100% overlap on the top and put it on nice and snug. It doesn't need 50% overlap, it's just to hold it down. When you come through, again, you can just pinch four inches of cling, easily becomes one inch. So you just go through here. You're not obliged to finish it, but it doesn't matter. This is on the other side of the plaster. I've got my tape ready. And now we've done the traction. We've done the reduction. We've applied the splint material. This fracture that we reduced, so it was up, so it was up here, we reduced it. It wants to go back up here. So we're going to mold it to discourage it from shifting that way. So my proximal hand goes proximal to the fracture. My distal hand goes distal to the fracture. I'm at 90 degrees to the patient, and you can just relax for one second, and I'm just pushing down. So my, uh, my, my second metacarpal is on his distal radius, and I'm just pushing down. You'll notice my hands are flat. There's a tendency to squeeze as much as we can like this. And when you squeeze, what happens is you get a circle. But a natural forearm is not a circle, it's an oval. And you want an oval for the forearm. So leave your fingers out flat. 
If your hands are big enough, like mine are, I can drop my fourth and fifth finger and I can just only deviate. But if your hands aren't big enough, or if the patient's big, Jeff, and I can have you back, sorry. If you just grab his thumb and two fingers again, he's gonna pull them in ulnar deviation. And I'm just gonna work on now getting the flexion. And then you just sit here and you wait. You wait until the plaster hardens. And if you have eight or 10 layers, you'll actually feel the heat come off of it. And if you're not feeling the heat, it means you're leaving too soon. So you want it to be hardened before you let go of the mold. The other tendency in Emerge, we have a little bit of ADHD. So what do we do when we're sitting here? We're like, keep moving our hands up and down. And all you're doing is you're cracking the plaster while it's setting. Don't do it. Once you're in the position that you want, just sit there and just wait and breathe and just take your time. Use your bigger muscles. It's not your small muscles of your hand. It's the flat parts of it. One other little tip I forgot to tell you, if it's an older patient, we're sometimes worried about like tearing the skin. You can just grab your hand for one second. One little tip you can do with these older patients is actually push up on the skin first, grab the distal fragment, and then pull down. And what you're doing is you're not stretching the skin, you're actually just bringing it back out to neutral. So there's less likely of tearing it if that's a concern of yours. So once it's done, do a post-reduction film. What's a good splint? His elbow is free, his biceps isn't caught. His thumb is nice and free. Older patients have CMC arthritis. If you immobilize an arthritic joint, it shuts down. His fingers should be free. His fingers should be able to touch down. His MCP should be free. You can fold this back if you want. And then it's well molded at the splint. A little bit of flexion, a little bit of ulnar deviation. This is a well molded splint. You can see it's post reduction. Up top is one of our Emerge Docs loves fiberglass. That's fiberglass, and you can measure on your post-reduction films. Second metac a line along parallel to the radius, second metacarpal. You want about 10 degrees of flexion. Here, a procedural sedation was done. The patient was put in a circumferential cast, but there's no mold. And there's an orthopedic saying that for fractures that might shift, a straight cast leads to a crooked bone, and a crooked cast leads to a straight bone. And if you're doing a reduction, and the reduction's, if these, if the reduction's gonna be the final piece, which often it is, what happens is you want a crooked cast. And every ortho book will tell you it's easier to make a crooked cast out of plaster than it is out of fiberglass. Okay, Paul, thank you very much. I think the propofol's worn off. Thanks, buddy.